It's so good uh, to be with you all this morning. I'm Becky Duvall Reese, um, retired museum director. We're talking to Francine Carrara earlier, who has just retired, and she said, "I'm not comfortable yet." And I said, "Give it a year, and it'll be it'll be hard to remember those early morning hours." So here we are. I want to thank uh, Maurice McDermott, her staff, Ron Tyler, Michael Judy, all the curators involved in the exhibition, um, and we're really, and especially Mary Margaret McAllen, who has brought us all together here in this conference. So, my pleasure to introduce Francine, who we've known each other a while. She uh, did undergraduate work at Hendricks College in Arizona, an MFA at uh, SMU in art history, and I first knew her as a student uh, at UT Austin. She got her PhD with uh, William Getzman in American Studies, and Ron and I were on her dissertation committee, so that was, that was pretty special. Uh, Francine taught uh, at Texas State University in San Marcos, and I think those years were 1989 to 2000. She left as a full tenured professor, and I tell you, in academia, that is amazing to give up a full professor tenured position. But you know, I've always seen Francine as an adventurer and kind of always looking for that next great experience. And she found it in the museum world. She uh, was uh, first director of the um, National, National Wildlife, what is it? The Wildlife Museum of Wildlife in Jackson, Wyoming. And then she went to Bar Harbor, Maine. Then she came back to the Grace Museum in Abilene, and then lastly, Wichita Falls. So with all those jobs, she brought exhibitions, she brought publications, she gave talks. She sent me her short bio, and when I opened it, it was multiple pages, so I didn't even bother opening the long bio. <laughs> it was a lot. So I am really happy to introduce to you all my multifaceted friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Professor Director Francine Carrara. Thank you, Becky. Becky was my mentor. She was not only on my dissertation committee, but she, be, she was a museum director before me, and I, 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 was, I always admired that. I want to thank the Whitty and TCU for the opportunity to participate in this major exhibition. Um, it has been a five-year project, and it's really one of the great highlights of my career. And when you see the exhibition, you're going to be so impressed. Um, this, and it's so, it's so right that it's here at the Whitty Museum, which has a remarkable history of Texas, uh, in Texas and with Texas art. So they asked me to, um, to present uh, our program today, and um, I, this, is, this, <clears throat> this paper is pretty close to my chapter that's going to be in the publication uh, of the book that accompanies the exhibition. The 1936 Texas Centennial was a particularly important event in the history of Texas, and the Centennial Exposition in Dallas was important in the history of art in Texas. 
The centennial brought national attention to Texas art and artists who were declaring artistic independence and practicing their own stylistic expression of regionalism to, visual, to visualize a new image of Texas. The Texas scene was the American scene in art of the 1930s. Across the entire state, celebrations of the 100th anniversary of Texas independence from Mexico in 1836 became occasions of both retrospection and great optimism for Texans. Texas Governor James V. Aldred, who traveled across the nation with an entourage of 500 Texans on the Texas Centennial Press Train, brought that spirit to New York City in May 1936 to invite bankers and Wall Street brokers to invest in Texas, quote, the land of unparalleled opportunity, end quote extending an invitation to New Yorkers to come to Dallas to celebrate the Texas Centennial, Governor Allred stood on the steps of the New York City Hall and presented Mayor Fiorillo LaGuardia with an official 10-gallon cowboy hat, announcing that Texas was the nation's new economic frontier. Quote, we are discovering after 100 years, Allred proclaimed, that our natural resources have not been scratched. Governor Allred voiced the celebration of the new image of Texas that was central to the message of the centennial. The centennial brought the opportunity to many newcomers to Texas to discover their state's history and to celebrate art in Texas. The changes in Texas' 100-year history were significant. The population of the state of Texas had grown from about 50,000 in 1836 to six million in 1936. Proud Texans were aware that Texas was developed, informed, conditioned, um, and conditioned by a number of factors unique to the state. Its history of independence as a republic, its distinctive geography and vast spaces, its rich cultural heritage and diverse population. Texans of 1936 realized that their character was molded by rural and urban experiences as they were witnessing changes in the economic dynamics of the state. The Texas Centennial Celebration celebrated historic Texas of the western frontier, contemporary Texas of a new economic frontier, and the culture of Texas reflected in new frontier in art. As Texas historian Light Townsend Cummings and Patrick Cox observed, the Texas Centennial marked a significant moment in the economic and cultural development of the state, and the events, and the events of celebration, quote, embodied a new Texas image and myth that combined factual and fictional material, end quote. The New Texas image was understood as both a descendant of a Western heritage and a parent of a new frontier. In decades of planning for the 100th anniversary of Texas independence, Dallas fought to become the official site of the 1936 Texas Centennial Exposition. While the nation was recovering from the wake of the Great Depression, Dallas produced a spectacular celebration at the total cost of $25 million. The Dallas Fair Park was transformed by architect George Dahl into an Art Deco magic city with 26 exposition buildings, including a new permanent art museum. From June 6th through November 29th, 1936, more than six million people attended the Texas Centennial Exposition in Dallas, including President Delano, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And here's the midway. Identifying Texas as the new western frontier and no longer as the old south was celebrated during the centennial, but that image was molded well before 1936. The Texas image was forged by actual historic events and by collective public memory. Beginning in the 1920s, folklorist J. Frank Doby awakened Texans to their unique cultural heritage and created an image of Texas about the land 
and the people based on traditions of life during the days of the open range. The rapid and visible changes in Texas economy of the early 20th century cultivated a new per perception of Texas in popular culture. While cotton had provided most of the state's wealth in the late 19th century, the discovery of oil in the first decade of the 20th century changed the Texas economy and brought social changes that shaped the character of Texas and Texans. Visual artists across Texas in cities of Dallas, Houston, San, San, and San Antonio were witnessing and recording the changes as new oil companies emerged, new commercial enterprises established, new roads appeared, and as cities grew with increasing demands for workers. Artists documented and celebrated this economic growth. In 1923, Edward G. Eisenlohr, a Cincinnati-born Texan who had studied art in Germany, painted the construction of the Magnolia Petroleum Building, a Beaux-Arts skyscraper in downtown Houston. <clears throat> As 29 at 29 stories, it was the tallest building until 1926 when the skyline was filled with tall buildings that sprang up from great growth in the Texas economy. Dallas painter Lloyd Goff, who studied art with Texas teachers and, and at the Academy Julianne in Paris, painted the construction of the Tower Petroleum Building on Elm Street in downtown Dallas. Goff portrayed the iron girders that framed the building designed by Texas architect Mark Lemon. The finished Art, art Deco building, which opened in 1931, had 23 stories clad in limestone with modern motifs, and the upper stories had two setbacks, revealing modernist skyscraper architecture um, and rivaling the architecture of New York City and Chicago. Here is a slide of the uh, 1931 Tower Building. Today, it is now the Cambria Hotel. Artist Olin Herman Travis, Dallas-born, and st who studied at the, uh, at the Chicago Art Institute and later founded the Dallas Art Institute in 1926, registered the economic changes in Texas in two important portraits. In 1929, Travis portrayed the results of the economic boom and bust in The Workman, a heroic portrait of an unemployed steel worker named Simon Stalin, who was who who was in World War, who was a World War I veteran and native of Ozark, Arkansas. Travis portrayed the laborer wearing coveralls and placed in an industrial setting. He was not a farmer or a rancher. He was neither a shopkeeper nor a cowboy, but a resolute American worker. Around 1932, when the effects of the Great Depression were evident in Texas, Travis painted a dismal portrait titled Mayor of Hoover City, Texas. Picturing a man staring hopelessly and clutching a wooden cr crutch with a tent city behind him and the skyline of Dallas in the distance. American regionalist artist Thomas Hart Benton recognized and portrayed the momentous changes in Texas. He grew up in Missouri, but every spring as a child, he visited his maternal grandparents' cotton farm near Waxahachie, Texas. Benton witnessed and understood the changes in the Texas economy. As he traveled through Texas in 1926 on one of his many sojourns to discover America and to paint authentic American subjects, he stopped in Borger, Texas in the Panhandle. The boom town of Borger grew to a population of 20,000 within three months after the discovery of a substantial oil field. Benton complete, completed a drawing from his accommodations in Borger above the American Beauty Bakery. The sketch served as the basis for his 1928 painting titled Boomtown, which he completed in his studio in New York. 
hailed by Benton's biographer Henry Adams as one of Benton's first major American scene paintings. The subject is the hastily built town, the hustle and bustle in the streets to make deals for drilling oil and securing royalties. In the background is, a, is the former ranching landscape dotted now with wooden oil derricks and a large pillar of black oil smoke. This was the new American West for Benton. He found in Boomtown Borger a revitalization and remaking of the West. Benton portrayed the dramatic reality of the economic changes in Texas and the romantic image of a new frontier. An aside, I grew up in Borger, Texas. My father was an independent oil producer. While Thomas Hart Benton was painting an iconic Texas scene, momentum was building for a regionalist movement in Texas art. The January 1928 issue of Southwest Review, a literary, pub a literary publication by Southern Methodist University in Dallas, included an article titled Culture by Henry Nash Smith. The article identified and promoted regionalism, urging Texas artists to create from fresh experience and to reflect their own environment in their art. Smith advised artists that a Texas culture could be recognized only if artists had, quote, an understanding of their own time and place, end quote. The article called for the public to recognize the achievements of a group of young Dallas artists, including painter Jerry Bywaters, who was a good friend of Henry Nash Smith. Between 1928 and 1936, the group of artists whom Nash promoted was indeed portraying their image of Texas with new vision. Bywaters remembered how the circle of Dallas artists grew, quote, the group the group of Alexander Hogue, Tom Stell, Frank Klepper, Revo Bassett, and Charles Bowling was followed by Otis Dozier, Everett Spruce, William Lester, Perry Nichols, John Douglas, Harry Conahan, and many others, end quote. In the wake of the Great Depression, these artists examined, recorded, and interpreted familiar subject matter in new stylistic terms. The subjects of their paintings of the early 1930s often mirrored the hard times of the Depression and the Dust Bowl. In such works as Otis Dozier's 1936 Annual Move, Jerry Bywater's 1937 Sharecropper, and <clears throat> Alexander Hogue's 1934 Drought Stricken Area, and this one, the 1933 Dust Bowl. Artists across Texas were finding new expressive means to portray their own time and place. Many of these artists had migrated to urban areas of Texas from rural environment. Some had little formal art training. Others had studied at the New York Art Students League, the Chicago Art, art Students League, or abroad. And as their art developed, it reflected particular qualities of Texas' physical and social landscape. They were formulating a kind of Texas regionalism, but each of the artists was individually concerned with developing a personal idiom rather than contributing to a particular national movement. The artists of the 1930s in Texas were not homogeneous in their stylistic approach to regionalism. Consider the varied approaches, ranging from Everett Spruce expressionism in uh, suburban landscape, William Lester's primitivism in Oklahoma rocks, Otis Dozier's formalism in jackrabbits, Harry Carnahan's surrealism in West Texas landscape, Tom Stell's realistic portrait of Miss Dale Hurd. Pictured are Carl Benton Compton's narrative Sunday morning and Florence McClung's panoramic landscape Squaw Creek Valley. As their individual styles developed in the early 1930s, a body of work emerged among the Texas artists that appeared similar in motif and theme. Their work was characterized stylistically by a cohesive concern for strong compositions, clear light, earthy colors, and local subjects. Like earlier generations of artists in Texas, they were painting Texas landscapes, still life, portraits, and narratives. However, the new generation was, an, was using an expressive vocabulary with a clear vision of the Texas scene. 
excited by news of French modernism that liberated expression, and excited by Mexican murals that expounded regional identity, these Texas artists rejected the aesthetic and painting style of an earlier generation of Texas artists they called blue bonnet painters. The younger artists moved away from Impressionism with its vague shapes, loose compositions, and pastel colors. And in doing so, they achieved a regional aesthetic and artistic identity as exemplified by this great 1936 painting, Church at the Crossroads, by Charles Bowling. The story of Texas art and artists of the 1930s paralleled the stylistic evolution of a national movement known as the American scene. But the Texas art scene had a distinctive story. Discovering the region as a, mean to, as a means to discover America, Texas painters and sculptors saw themselves as avant-garde artists in the pursuit of identifying a truly American art. However, they did not identify themselves completely with the American scene movement. They were properly regionalists, but they were not social realists. Grounded in Texas subjects, themes, and images, they aspired to express universal concepts. While Texas regionalism represented a spectrum of progressive tendencies in American art, they were opposed to provincialism. Key figures in Texas regionalism included Otis Dozier, William Lester, Charles Bowling, Jerry Bywaters, Alexander Hogue, Corinne Spellman, Florence McClung, all of whom you will see paintings in the exhibition all of whom understood the significance of their endeavors to shape the art world in Texas and in America. They also aspired to attract national recognition to the art of their region, and their views were vindicated by the national attention afforded them early in their careers. The National New Deal art programs greatly benefited the importance and visibility of the careers of the Texas regionalism. As recognized practitioners of the regionalist aesthetic, Texas artists competed for and participated in the New Deal art, art programs, which they believed to be a driver in the emergence of a renaissance in American art. John Ankeny, who was director of the Dallas Museum of Fine Arts, became the director of Region 12 of the Public Works of Art Project, which was established in 1932 by President, President Roosevelt. Ankeny was invited to Washington, D.C. to plan the New Deal program to provide assistance for artists and to support the emergence of a national art made up of regional schools. Plans for the PWAP were based solidly on the values and aesthetic of the American scene movement. Under Ankeny's direction, within weeks of the announcement of the PWAP program, artists in Texas were receiving commissions. The art community readily accepted the opportunities and viewed the program as a vehicle to present their art to a larger audience. Across Texas, paintings by Harry Carnahan, John Douglas, William Lester, Perry Nichols, Catherine Travis, Ruby Stone, Frank Klepper, Jerry Bywaters, Elizabeth Boatwright, Olin Travis, and many others appeared on the walls of high schools, hospitals, libraries, and county courthouses. In less than a year, <clears throat> the program was revised and a new federal program was formed, the Treasury Department Section of Painting and Sculpture, to secure art for new public buildings through open competitions for commissions. By 1943, more than 75 New Deal murals were completed in Texas, including the dramatic stampede scene in El Paso by, Tom, by artist Tom Stell uh, for the Odessa Post Office, the stylized history of the panhandle in six large panels by San Antonio artist Julius Veltz for the Amarillo Federal Courthouse and Post Office. The plaster relief panels depicting oil, cattle, and wheat by Dallas artist Ali Tennant for the Electra Post Office. The New Deal art <clears throat> was confirmation for Texas artists of their importance in the American scene movement. It was the 1936 
Texas Centennial Celebration in Dallas that focused national attention on Texas artists. One of the six new fairground museums was the first permanent modern facility for the Dallas Museum of Fine Arts, which opened its doors to the public June 1, 1936. In the summer of 1936, 15,400 visitors attended the exhibition. In conjunction with the Texas Centennial Exposition, the new DMFA presented an impressive art exhibition especially selected to give Texans a complete survey of the history of European and American art and a comprehensive view of painting, sculpture, and graphic arts of the state of Texas. A 134-page illustrated catalog was produced for the exhibition by the new DMFA director, Robert Foster Howard, listing the artworks in the galleries with uh, an explanatory statement uh, for each category. The Primitive Gallery presented 24 artworks produced before 1500 AD, including work by Hieronymus Bosch, Albert Durer, and Fi Filipino Filip uh, Lippi. The Renaissance Gallery included 20 works by 15th century, 16th century, and 17th century artists, including Peter Paul Rubens, El Greco, and Rembrandt. The International Painting Gallery included the art of Diego Rivera, Max Beckman, Otto Dix, and Marc Chagall. The French Painting Gallery included works by Picasso, Dufy, Monet, Renoir, Matisse, and other Impressionists and Post-Impressionists. Two galleries of, <clears throat> were the retrospective of American art and contemporary American art, which included works by Cecilia Bowe, Grant Wood, Gilbert Stewart, Edward Hopper, among other American masters. The Southwest Painting Gallery included works by artists of the Taos Colony and artists who painted in the region, including Georgia O'Keeffe, Robert Henry, Thomas Hart Benton, Victor Higgins, and Carl Rungus. One gallery was devoted exclusively to Texas art. Among the many works on exhibition were these outstanding paintings. Alexander Hoag's Drought Stricken Area, Harry Carnahan's West Texas Landscape, Otis Dozier's Annual Move, Charles Bowling's Church at the Crossroads, Jerry Bywater's In the Chair Car, William Lester's Oklahoma Rocks, Corrine Spellman's Road Signs, and Everett Spruce's Suburban Landscape. The fact that the artwork of Texas artists was exhibited in close proximity with the artworks of European and American masters substantiated the claim that Texas art was integral to a renaissance of art. In the catalog, Howard made this assertion about Texas painting, quote, among the younger artists, there have been strong, con strong conscious, and alert rebellion against the academic. They have almost entirely skipped the phase in the 20th century thought and art which was concerned with abstraction and extreme distortion. They have jumped immediately to that ordered arrangement of real subject matter which, was gained, which has gained, un unfortunately, notoriety as the American scene." End quote. His essay characterized Texas art quote, the clear sharp lines of much of this painting reflect the brilliant a clarity of the Texas atmosphere, above all the consistent and evident orderliness of design, regardless of subject matter, shows the trend of the history of art in the 20th century." End quote. The DMFA survey of Texas art was intended to demonstrate the vitality of the art of art across Texas in an impressive display of 168 artworks. However, Many of the artists represented and were mostly from Dallas. Also, while women artists were well represented in the exhibition, in most cases, their art was not displayed advantageously. In fact, works were hung in the hallways and in the basement. In addition, the art of African American artists of Texas was relegated to a segregated exhibition the Hall of Negro Life. Recent scholarship has examined the complex relationship between the centennial celebration and the state's minority populations. 
Cummings examined the contradictory leadership role of women in the planning of the centennial events and the minimal presentation of works of art by women, painters and sculptors in the entire exposition. In retrospect, the unfortunate and erroneous messages about the minority contributions to Texas culture espoused in the, expo in the exhibition, exposition has not gone unnoticed. Historian John Moran Gonzalez found the basis of the emergence of Texas, in Texas of Mexican-American literature as a reaction to the Anglo-centric uh, centennial message. Despite its ang Anglo-centric focus, at the time, the Dallas Museum of Fine Arts Texas Art Exhibition was regarded as a milestone in art in Texas, and the Centennial Exposition was viewed as a positive occurrence and, an impor and important in codifying the singularity of Texas exceptionalism and its cultural uniqueness. The June 1931 I'm sorry, the June 1st, 1936 issue of Art Digest was devoted exclusively to the Texas Centennial Exhibition and to Texas artists. Magazine editor Peyton Boswell announced, quote, this is the largest number in publication of the Art Digest in nearly 10 years of its life, and maybe it's the most interesting to American people, end quote. The laudatory tone of the publication in describing the artwork of Texans was confirmation that the Texas artists were a vital part of a national movement. Texas artists reveled in the spotlight that brought them out of geographical isolation and into the center of American art. Texas art advocates and painter, advocate and painter Jerry Bywaters contributed an article to this special 1936 edition of Art Digest. His article titled Against Narrowness offered a history of the development of art in Texas and explained how contemporary Texas art fit into the mainstream of American art. These ideas were major themes of Bywater's numerous articles on Texas art in the Dallas Morning News and in the Southwest Review. Bywaters convinced Texas artists that they were an integral part of an American art renaissance. For Bywaters, the Texas scene was the American art scene. The, the Texas regionalists subscribed to the, to the Centennial Exposition's image of Texas as the new frontier, and they characterized their art as integral to the new stylistic frontier in American art. In 1936, another important exhibition was held in Dallas at the John Douglas Gallery, entitled 13 Dallas Artists. The director of the new <clears throat> Dallas Museum of Fine Arts, Richard Howard, wrote the foreword in the small exhibition catalog. And he, um, he says that the 11 painters and two sculptors in this group represented the most significant yet natural regional development in contemporary art. Included in the exhibition, there's the list of the artists um, in this 13 Dallas Artists exhibition. They shared characteristic thematic material with sharply defined forms in their paintings and colors borrowed from the Texas landscape. With individual stylistic approaches, they were united in their interpretation of their own time and place. 30 miles away from the Texas Centennial Exhibition of Texas Art and the John Douglas Art Gallery exhibition in Dallas was the Fort Worth Frontier Exposition. This centennial exhibition observed and focused the, on the old frontier with a special emphasis on popular culture. An exhibition of art of the American West was presented at the Fort Worth Exhibition that provided an historic survey of Western art by such art, great artists as George Catlin, Frank Tinney Johnson, Frederick Remington, Charles Russell, and, and as well as works by Taos artists, uh, Ernest Blumenschein, Irving Kaus, Herbert Dunton, uh, Joseph Henry Sharp, and others. A few Texas artists, both historic and contemporary, were represented in the Fort Worth exhibition, including sculpture by Elizabeth Ney, a 19th century German academically trained sculptor, uh, 
The paintings by Frank Ray, teacher and landscape painter, trained at the St. Louis School of Fine Arts. Harold Bugby, Texas painter, printmaker, and muralist. Edward Eisenlor, academically trained Dallas artist and teacher. And John Tex Moore, a self-taught painter of Western subjects. By curatorial design, the new Texas Regionalist artists were not represented in the Fort Worth exhibition. By contrast between the DMFA's exhibition focused on Texas art and the Fort Worth exhibition focused on Western art was significant. Bywater's article, The New Texas Painters, published in the 1936 spring edition of, of the Southwest Review, credited Texas artists Eisenlor and Ray as pioneers in portraying Texas subjects. Bywaters and other Texas regionalists valued the artists of the Texas art colony. Alexander Hoag viewed Blumenschein and Dunton and Bistrom as his mentors for their depictions of landscapes and indigenous American subjects. However, while earlier Texas artists and popular Taos artists were, uh, were appreciated by the Dallas regionalists, they were not considered by Bywaters and Hoag and others to be in touch with the national American trends, nor identified with the contemporary regionalist aesthetic, subject, or style. Texas regionalists generally feared and disliked being characterized as cowboy artists or Western artists. They insisted that their art was neither Western nor provincial, nor isolated from the larger world of art. Moreover, the Texas artists of the 1930s resisted being identified as regionalists, although that term best fits their aesthetic and stylistic approach. Arguably, Many of the Texas artists of the 1930s portrayed, women's, portrayed Western subjects, including cowboys, horses, ranches, roundups, and rodeos. A major painting by Jerry Bywaters on the ranch, a still life and landscape combined, that pictures ordinary objects associated with the land and activities of ranching. Bywaters com completed a Conte crayon study, a lithograph, and an oil on tempera, um, in tempera, all of the same subject and all with the same title, On the Ranch. The 1942 painting pictures a landscape with a windmill and barbed wire fence in the distance, and close up in the foreground is a still life of an, an unusual collection of objects. Although the display seems haphazard, the objects have special symbolic meaning for bywaters. There are symbols of the first inhabitants of Texas in the Indian arrowhead and traces of the ranching history in the cowboy's discarded spurs and rusted gun. The horse skull, dead branch, and thriving prickly pear are reminders of nature's tenacity in a dry land. These objects of Texas past were revered and preserved in this painting. This work is an icon of American West, but Bywaters would not have defined it as Western art. It is typical in the regionalist point of view. The general and the timeless are stated in the specific and the finite. Texas regionalists produced a body of artworks that presented dramatic images of places and things in Texas that were not dramatic at all, but were transformed by the vision of the artists. The message of the 1936 Texas Centennial and the image of the new Texas was an abiding basis for Texas regionalist art. From 1936, when the Texas regionalists were spotlighted nationally at the Texas Centennial, they continued to express their vision of Texas and to exhibit widely. The movement was strong until the New Deal projects ended and World War II began. Regionalism evolved into abstraction as a modernist stylistic evolution moved through American art. Artists in Texas who had developed and prospered with the regionalist aesthetic in the, early, in, in the 30s and in the early 40s evolved stylistically toward modernism in the decade of the 1950s and 60s, but they never abandoned their interest in portraying the essence of people and places in their region. Eight decades later, the Texas regionalist art of the 1930s still resonates with freshness and continues to tell a timeless story. There has been good scholarship and publications on this energetic era. Today, private collectors and public museums enthusiastically collect artworks from the period. Two iconic paintings reveal the, and represent the tenets and brilliance of Texas regionalism. 
They are exemplary of the reasons why Texas art of the 1930s continues to bring new meaning to the image of Texas. Road signs painted by Corrine Mary Spellman in 1936 pictures a group of highway signs in the foreground of a vast Texas landscape with low horizon. The subject of the painting is both a specific reference to the identity of the artist and a general statement about the image of a changing Texas. Spellman lived and worked in Denton, where she taught art for 50 years at the College of Industrial Arts, later Texas Women's University. Born in a small town of Forney, Texas, and raised in Dallas, Spellman studied art at Columbia University and at the University of Iowa. In Texas art scene of the 1930s, which was denominated dominated by male artists, male museum directors, with few patrons and no commercial art galleries. Spellman's excellent paintings and etchings, etchings competed for and successfully achieved national attention beginning in 1929 in solo exhibitions as well as invitational exhibitions at the Dallas Museum of Fine Art, the Museum of Fine Art Houston, and at the Whitty Museum in San Antonio, among others. The well-composed composition of road signs and the unusual subject are evident of, Su of Spellman's mastery of portraying the penetrating light, minimal color, and dry atmosphere of the Texas landscape. The painting depicts the clutter of road signs at an intersection that unites a country road and a highway, implying that the rural past of Texas is converging with an urban future. Spellman understood that in 1936, Texas was at a cultural crossroads. Not only was Texas regionalism being recognized nationally, <clears throat> but also Spellman's own career as an artist was being recognized and validated. Otis Dozier grew up in Lawson, Texas, a, on a small farm, where he drew continually farm animals and crops. He had a naturalist curiosity about the structure and composition of plants and animals. When the price of cotton dropped in 1921 and the oil economy was beginning to boom, Dozier's family, like many others, migrated to the city to secure jobs. In the 1920s, Do Otis Dozier studied art at the at the Onspa School of Art in Dallas and at the Dallas Art Institute with Olin Travis. Dozier's 1936 painting, Cotton Bowl, is typical of his landscapes and his propensity to depict nature close up. An intense observation of the landscape, Dozier would select a plant, animal, or formation of rocks, and with a few well-composed elements, capture the essence of the landscape and instill meaning in the image. This painting is more of a still life than a landscape. The cotton plant is portrayed in every stage and season of its growth as one plant, with a flowering blossom, budding bod, pod, budding pod, and cotton bowl against a wide, flat dirt field. Dozier lived and understood the economic changes in the Texas experience. In his painting, he remembered Texas's rural past but the image is neither sentimental nor nostalgic. Like the biblical explanation of continuous creation from the Gospel of Mark, quote, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear, end quote, Dozier portrayed a symbolic plant of fulfillment with purpose that continually produces without decay or decline. That was the optimism of the image of Texas celebrated in 1936. These two paintings represent the essence of what Texas regionalism considered significant in art. The artworks reflect each artist's individuality as they express their region and subject and spirit. Each artist was technically proficient that demonstrated their ability to handle composition, color, structure. Each painting successfully unites significant content with substantial form. Each artist presents with integrity a personal interpretation of the subject. Those critical elements embodied in each painting were considered essential by Texas regionalists for the creation of timeless art. Analyzed and confirmed by American art historian William H. Gertz in his de definition of Texas regionalism as art that, quote, entered into the mainstream of American culture serving a social purpose in depicting their native environment integral to national artistic inspiration, end quote. 
These ideas were so clearly understood by Texas regionalist artists in 1936 that four decades later, Otis Dozier still convinced of its truth. In an interview in 1976 concerning the nature of good art and his own career as a painter, Dozier summed up the Texas regionalist aesthetic simply and succinctly. You've got to start from where you are and hope to get to the universal. Indeed, as evidenced by this major exhibition of 250 years of art in Texas, the Texas art scene has been and is, and it endures as the American art scene. Thank you. Okay, my, is this on? Okay, put it right in my mouth. Um, I think my job right now is to be, uh, to ask you all if you have questions for Francine. Um, but before I do that, I, I want to apologize because I didn't, in my introduction, let you know that she is the author of the the biography on Jerry Bywaters. It was published in 2007, Jerry Bywaters, A Life in Art. And it is a wonderful book, Texas A&M University Press published. I really recommend you all read it. It's, it's, it's a really beautiful book. Thank you for this great talk, Francine. So uh, are there questions that you all have? Yes. I was wondering about the, you know, the Centennial Exhibition and the list of people that you read, but there were a lot of people that you didn't read. And I'm wondering what you've learned about some of those other artists that were in the Centennial Exhibition. Was it a, was it vastly? It, yeah, was it, well, one of the great scholars is, is Dr. Davis <laughs> right here, who has done work on the Centennial Exhibition. The exhibition catalog, um, you, you'll find it in libraries. I bet the Witty has one. Take a look at it, and, uh, and you'll see a lot of similarity between many of those paintings that were in that exhibition that's, that's in this exhibition now. Oh, thank you. And um, a lot of good scholarship has been done on many of those artists. Um, Light Cummings and, and Vicki Cummings is also now working uh, on uh, a, a new book about women artists in Texas, and um, and so there's there's the fields are pretty fertile. There's there's lots of work to be done, and um, so uh, but but the Texas Centennial Exhibition I think was certainly a major a major exhibition. Another major one was Images of Texas that Becky Reese produced in 80, 83. Uh, at the at the University of Texas, and um, so uh, so you'll you'll get these kind of landmark exhibitions along the way, um, and you'll see many of the same artists represented. Um, but it, but one just aside on that, women artists. I'm I'm helping the uh, Vicky and Light on the that book on the women artists. Women artists are it's kind of they're they're difficult to unearth. And it, but they're but they're there. We we just have to do the digging. Um, but most of them were wonderful teachers of art, and um, also because there were the, most of these decades there were not commercial art galleries, um, so they don't have a record of exhibiting. Um, and that that doesn't. I mean, it, so we just have to keep looking for how. But there were great women artists producing wonderful things, and and I um, I mean like. And, and at the time, and I made the point, Corinne Spellman was certainly recognized in that day against all odds. But um, Jack, when are you going to give us another talk about your women artists? Jack said, okay, go get, get. Yeah, as Francine said, they were not given the major spots to exhibit in. They had the hallways and the basement and those sorts of things. Corrine Spellman and others were in, uh, she was in, in McClung, I believe, were in right. the main gallery. 
But beyond that, the women were very unrecognized. And um, there's, there's wonderful um, art out there that these women did. There were nine in Denton who spent their careers at what's now Texas Woman's University. And um, they are uh, superb artists. They all had master's degrees from Columbia University. Uh, they were students of, um, of um, Charles Martin, who was a protege of Arthur Wesley Dow, who was the founder of modernism and American art. So it's a wonderful history. I'm going to talk this afternoon a little bit about more women artists, because in 1989, uh, my late colleague Patricia Hendricks and I did a century of sculpture in Texas. And in doing that research, we went to museums and we went into their storage, and we found an amazing number of very important women sculptors. And we got put them in the show, and but we're just stunned that there were more like 10 or 15 women who were in the Met and had shown, you know, in MoMA. So, um, yeah, women artists are there. And we're out of time, and um, there are, our <laughs> timekeepers are keeping thank us you. on. But um, thank you. Thank you.